Okay, good evening and welcome. Thank you everyone for coming and joining us. My name is Goldie Grossbaum and I'm the director of Camp Daniel Strahl Toronto. It's so refreshing and such a pleasure to see so many like-minded parents here tonight that are dedicated to our children's well-being and making sure our children have the most productive summer filled with fun and excitement and of course, growth. It's well known that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said at Asikhan, Chavav Sivan, Tavshin Lamed Vav, that the advantage of sending a child to overnight camp, where he's completely and entirely in the same atmosphere for 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the same environment, he doesn't receive any effect from the outside world. He's completely enveloped, enveloped in an atmosphere filled with warmth, Yiddish kind of highest, and it's such an amazing opportunity for our children. Knowing that, I feel a special cost and responsibility and a partner with all of you to ensure that our children have a safe summer, begashmias and baruchmias, and that we can all have the proper hashpa on our children and campers. Camp is a place where children can blossom and thrive. And Baruch Hashem, there are so many camps dedicated to making sure your children have this amazing opportunity to feel loved, to be able to develop and grow in an amazing environment where they feel content, complete joy, and fulfilled. For most campers, it's just that. It's a wholesome opportunity where they gain so much and leave camp so strong in their Yiddish fight, in their confidence, in the new friendships they've formed. But for some campers, and the beginning of camp can be a struggle. So knowing your child and best preparing your child can really help them over navigate overnight camp. Like I said, some campers, the transition is really smooth, really easy, and it comes really naturally. Parents know your children best. And if your child generally gets anxious or nervous or has anxiety when faced with new circumstances or has been occasionally homesick when they're away from home, discuss that with your child before camp and help them figure out different ways that they can help themselves navigate the new situation and the new exciting experience that they're about to have. If you parents can help them be best prepared emotionally, they will have those tools ready if they need them. And they'll feel much more confident going to camp, getting on that bus that first few moments, it'll be much easier for them. I remember when I was younger, my mother sat me down. I was nine or 10 years old and I was the oldest in my family. And my mother was unsure how I would be in camp. Would I be homesick? Would I need her advice to navigate different social situations? Would I be responsible about taking care of my, all my things? So many unknowns. So my mother sat me down and we discussed what a day in camp would look like from morning through evening. And what are different situations that could come up and what would be the best solution for those obstacles? My mother then took my pinky finger and she kissed it all over. And she said that if I ever feel like I need her or I need a hug, I should just hold the pinky finger next to my face and she'll be right there. And looking back, I don't remember if I ever even used my special pinky because I wasn't homesick and I didn't have a hard time adjusting. But knowing that I had my mother's, my mother's kiss on my pinky finger really helped me feel calm and be ready for camp. So definitely speaking to your children before camp and giving them some insight on possibly your fun camp memories and some tips that work for you could be really helpful, helpful to your child. You've noticed that the past few years, Homesickness and anxieties are much more prevalent in camp than years before. And what used to be a few hours of nervousness, are they in the bunk that they wanted? Are they with their friends? Do their counselors look the most exciting? Did they get the right bed that they wanted? Now we find it lingers for longer than a few hours with some campers. So from a camp perspective, being open and honest before camp, touching base with your camp director and your camp, your, your child's counselors, about the possibility of your child having anxiety or fears can really benefit your child. It could even be something simple like thunderstorms. But if a camp knows that your child gets nervous and has a fear of thunderstorms, they'll be best prepared to help her when a thunderstorm is approaching and help her feel safe. In our camp, in the first few days that camp starts, all the counselors call their camp parents, call their camper's parents, to find out how they could help their child grow. But if it's a real anxiety and a concern, please let the camp know in advance so that they can help your child and know what tools to help your child find and work through so that they can have the best summer possible. The topic tonight is building resiliency, helping kids cope with homesickness and succeed in new environments and relationships 
which camp is filled up. So I have the privilege to introduce our illustrious speaker, Mrs. Rifke Youngrice. She has a master's in education, is a licensed clinical social worker, and is an adult, adolescent, and child psychotherapist, somatic practitioner, sound play therapist, very long, Rifke, and approved uh, consultant and certified EMDR clinician and EMDR child specialist specializing in anxiety, abuse, and trauma. Rifke is also a member of the Association for Play Therapy, board member and training coordinator of Nefesh International. She was a program coordinator of Summer Project Safe Camp of Maganil Adim, Safety Kit Institute in New York, and served as the executive board member of NYCTRN, New York City EMDR Trauma Recovery Network for Disasters Response Worldwide. Rifki, we are so excited to hear all your thoughts on how we can help our campers be the best they can be. The floor is yours. Thank you, Goldie. That was a great introduction. And you touched on so many topics that are so relevant. So obviously, you're quite experienced. Firstly, I want to thank, um, I want to thank uh, um, the program Operation Survival, which is headed by um, Rabbi Yaakov Bierman and Rabbi Hef. And I'm just getting to know a little bit about this organization, which is actually a prevention program. And I'm so, I was so glad to see something done on prevention because this is what all these talks and these things are about. Like if we can know beforehand and get set a child up, I think that's partially some of the things that I, I teach and I train and I do in my practice is letting kids know, letting kids who have anxiety know what's going to happen first, second, third, and it really enhances their experience and it takes the fear out of the unknown. Especially as Dildi said today, children are so much more anxious. There's so many more issues that are prevalent that we're facing. Um, so the program Operation Survival run by Yaakov Bierman under the National Committee for the Furtherance of Jewish Education by Rabbi Hef is, you know, something that's like an amazing program I'm seeing. And it has so many different branches, the release time hour out of public school, taking kids out. Um, an hour a week or more to teach Yiddishkeit. And then there's a program about helping children with toys that are hospitalized. So I really wanna thank you for having me here and I really appreciate it. So um, what I would like to do without further ado is that I put together a, a PowerPoint because I thought, um, I always feel that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm gonna try to do this. Um, and let me see if I can, okay, hold on. Uh, here we are. Okay. Okay, so now I have to try to see, to open this. Okay. Hold on. Okay. And I'll try to do it into a slideshow so it's a little easier. Um, slider, slideshow. Okay. Okay, this is basically, I never mind speaking, but I always hate working with technology. So, so far, so good. Building resiliency and helping kids with homesickness. Now, um, one of the things that, um, I did some interviews with parents and with children and camp directors in preparation for this. And I also looked up some of the research so that I can be more informative for you in addition to some of my experiences. And one of the things that um, we recognize is that resiliency and attachment factors are very, very important to how your child is going to actually present in camp. So we have this welcome to summer camp these are the experiences that we're hoping. Um, and on our agenda is gonna be what a positive camp experience is like, what our attachment styles are, how did we connect with our parents and how that will make a difference um, to the way we adjust to camp. Resiliency is a good predictor for positive camp experience. So we'll talk a little bit about what resiliency is and how to even build it up. And even in the next six weeks, we still can prepare our children for camp and just recognizing the benefits of a camp experience. 
So the benefits of a camp experiment experience is actually promoting independence. You know, this is the first time a child will be away from home, possibly. Socialization and friendships, developing lifelong skills, problem solving, figuring out how to how to do anything, um, you know, a set for a play, how to do props, how to work with a team, positive role models. And, and it's really nice because one of the things that we don't have, well, we do still, but you know, it's funny, it was in the New York Times how kids don't really play outside anymore in the streets. Everybody's, you know, carpooled everywhere. Used to be in the summer, all ages of children were on the blocks playing. I think we still have some of that, but it was very hard because it's a real adjustment. You don't have different ages to interact with. You're only interacting with your class. So that in camp changes. Playtime and exercise, making memories, um, becoming more independent, new friends, counselors, peer relationships, warm supportive care, problem solving, sleeping away from home, even domestic skills like cabin cleaning duties. You know, there are some kids that have not come that are the, the youngest kid and they never really do anything or parents just don't want to give them responsibility. Or there is a child that has a lot of responsibility. She's the oldest of 10 children and she's constantly cleaning. So just doing her, 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 her bunk is like a breeze in the park. You know, those are the things that shifts it's like so different for each child the experience leadership opportunities you know again a, a family a, a big family or or a place where a child can shine sometimes if there's so many kids and the older kids take over and the youngest child isn't able to shine or have any opportunities to lead something she's always following this is a place that you can actually acquire some of that um, and learn about yourself building self-esteem, becoming a better person, challenging oneself, also having less self-doubt. If you figure out how to do something, you start to believe in yourself. And the other thing which I would hope they do is like the mindful exercises, just focusing on skills and even verbalizing mental problems, figuring things out together. And then there's the outdoor adventures, which I think you know, one of the things I do in, in after work, I'll, even if I don't have time to, to take a walk in the park, I'll just even go around the block or sometimes I'll just open my door to my office and just stand in the sun. Because I think it outdoors, which nature, which is something that we're not so privy to as, as, as city kids. So sleepaway camp is often the first time a child leaves home. And it's a for significant amount of time. And what happens is that it offers a, a good opportunity for us to consider the personal factors. What, and even thinking about it now, as we are prepared to send our children to camp, what's gonna predispose our children to positive or difficult experiences? So firstly, what we want from camp. Okay, now I, you know, there's a many, many different camps out there, but we should kind of know what we would like and what it should be set up so that you know, when you need to call, you're not nervous as a parent. You should know this is what camp should offer. You know, you're not asking, you're not getting out of your lane. You know, <laughs> if something comes up, you need to be prepared. So you want to know that, and, and I think that the counselors are prepped, you know, be there for the campers, staff friendliness, inclusive, emotional safety. Is there a camp mother? I mean, that's the first thing I used to find out when I sent my kids to camp. Who is going to be the camp mother <laughs> in case, you know? And I had some good experiences and some not good experiences. And it depends on the age that you send the kid. It depends on the, age, the child speaking up for themselves. It depends on the counselor if they're, you know, have awareness of their, of their bunk. So support for belonging, making everybody feel included, being open for new skills, overcoming challenges, the cooperative learning, you know, it's so interesting because in Japan, I don't know if anyone knows the education system there, but individuality is really frowned upon in Japan. Like if that one person gets up and says, oh, I got the answer, this and that, nobody's interested. It's really group learning. You're supposed to work as a team. And in America, it's very different. Like it's, I remember once my son saying, you know, I was, he was so hurt. He was a young boy and there was, he had a, a, a tremendous Rebbe and he was world famous and he was with his, you know, and everybody, all the kids wanted to impress the Rebbe with the bomb question. And he said that he was with the Sabrusa. They figured out a question and his Sabrusa just got up and ran to the Rebbe to tell the question by himself. He didn't even include my son. 
And it was like, but that's what it is. And here in camp, it, everything is projects together. Everything is teamwork. Your bunk has to be clean all together. It's really a nice thing to have some co cooperative um, togetherness. And then the, the, the camper's voice, a camper should feel listened to and have opportunity to express themselves. And again, I can't say enough about nature, nature, nature. So I'm gonna go into the attachment stalls because it's just a brief, a brief, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but what I would like to do by this is like, have you as a parent take a look at yourself and to see, you know, because part of your child's uh, adjustment to camp is how your camp experiences are, what your vibe is, how you feel. And, you know, there's a few different types of attachments. Now this is the dream of every attachment, but we might have a touch of this way or a touch of that one. And if you start to recognize that within yourself, you'll be able to see a difference and in, in, in how you could perhaps shift or change the way you speak to your child about camp. So this, this is secure attachment, which is great. You know, um, great parents with positive emotions, this ambivalent attachment, um, weary of strangers, the avoidant attachment where you avoid, you see the child is under the table. There's a disorganized attachment. So I'm gonna go through it a little quickly because I don't wanna spend too much time on it. But the secure obviously is the children with caregivers that are present, available, loving, responsive. They're attuned on the same wavelength, ability to separate and reconnect, the healthy, loving environment, protective, appropriate boundaries, communication, clear and appropriate, feeling the caregivers get you. The ambivalent attachment is children who have parents who are a little bit preoccupied. And it could be whether it's internal, you can't give as much, or you just um, are not, you're giving some, but not always. You're sometimes there, you're not there. It depends on your on the different circumstances in your life, the way you were brought up yourself or what's going on in the environmental factors, financial stress. So children with those kind of parents that like they're sometimes there and sometimes not, those children kind of worry what the parent is gonna do or not do or what they didn't do. They worry when the parents will believe it. When will they return? This is the child who got some attunement. They got some great stuff. They love it. They know nurturing, but it isn't consistent. Parents who's always late. They couldn't count on it. And now they're obsessed with getting it. So they become a little clingy and anxious. They might not have a sense of self. They're always looking outwards for approval. Mommy is coming. She's going to love me. She's not, you know. So that's looking towards the other for approval. When they do get the connection, they might not trust it. So there's this constant concern of abandonment. Now, again, this is like at the very end of the spectrum. Your child might have a touch of that. Doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It might be just, that's the type of parenting still you have, but being aware of it, you know, being able to direct your child in a different way is sometimes helpful. Then there's the anxious avoidant, that's parents with dismissing state of mind. So some parents are like, you know, grow up, you can handle this, you know, be strong, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. They, they don't really meet the child's emotional needs, they can't connect, they're not, the child doesn't always seem, feel seen or heard emotionally or felt. This misattunement sets up disappointment because the child's expectation is lowered. They don't expect anything and they become autonomous too early, which means that they themselves know they have to depend on themselves. They become self-reliant, they become dismissive. I don't need anybody. You know, those people that like ear cut, kiss, don't get too close, don't touch me. I could see when I, and then there's this disorganized children and that's really a very difficult, you know, um, situation when the parents are a threat and abusive, but also the attachment because they're supposed to be taking care of the child, but they don't. And then wires get really horribly crossed because parents are supposed to be providing protection and safety, but they're frightening and unsafe to the child. And those are the kids that are really at risk and are apt for difficult adjustment. But it's interesting because I just find that, um, I can tell when I have parents coming to my office what the attachment stall is with their parents. You know, sometimes I'll ask the parents, so give me five adjectives to describe your mom. You know, I always want to know when I'm working with children how they're parented and how the mother was parented. And we go back to the grandmother too. 
So it's very interesting. I'll ask them and she'll say, oh, she's amazing. She's a chesed person. She's always so giving. She's there for everybody. She does a lot of good. And I say to her, and are you close to her? Does your mother know you bring your child? Oh, no, 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 no. She, she can't handle that. Like that wouldn't, you know, so then it's totally a different picture. Like, what went down that you can't confide in your mother or you can't rely on your mother or you feel that maybe you're burdening her or she's just not around for that. So not that the mother isn't great, you know, but we have to unmesh that to see how we're going to deal with our child in a new situation. So we need to remember that all children are different. Mothers need to provide affirmations. They have to validate concerns and state things positively. I can't say this enough. We are our kids' mirrors. When our kids look at us, we are a mirror, which means if we're going to be frowning and critical and disapproving, then they look in that mirror and they think they're less than, they're not good, and they're just not able to. If we encourage and invalidate and believe in them, that's the mirror. So we are the kids' role models. And what is very important is to avoid making anxious or ambivalent statements to your children about the separation from them. If you're anxious, your child will sense it and become anxious as well. Instead, parents should try to express and soothe the enthusiasm, confidence, and optimism, optimism about the new experience. I'm laughing because I'm thinking, and, and, and even if you are concerned, act if you're not. And I remember I had one, one parent come into the office and she says to me, you know, my child, you know, loves dogs and I, there's dogs on the block and I get so crazy with it because I, you know, but she says, you know what, I'm really good about it. And I don't like show my feelings. And she says, you know, I just say to her, okay, okay. You know, just, just, just go on the other side. And if you're going to touch her, we, we need to use this, um, you know, we need to use this, um, what's it called? The, 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 the disinfectant, just be very, very careful when you go, oh, that puppy's so cute, but just really, really be careful. And she thinks she's not showing her anxiety, you know, as opposed to the mother that really loves puppies. She'll say, oh my gosh, this puppy is so adorable. Come, let's pat, can we get permission to pat the puppy? You know, it's, you think you're not passing it over, but you might be. So here we are with resilience. Um, when we have too many stresses in life, it pushes us into a state of disruption. Without resilience, we can't handle anything. No loss, chaos, dysfunction, and we can't ever move past difficult events. So resilience building starts from a very early age. We believe in our child. We try to build self-esteem. We try to build self-worth. And it's because children have experiences that they could overcome. Now, this has become a really difficult situation because our society or today we tend to do everything for our children. We really worry that they won't succeed. We're afraid they'll make mistakes. And a lot of parents are very hovering and not allowing the child to make the mistake so that if they fall, they can get up again and succeed and build some resiliency. So what is resiliency? It's problem solving skills, figuring out how goals set something with realistic expectations, learning from your mistakes. But if you're not letting a child make a mistake, they're not gonna learn from it. Understanding and acceptance, I'm weak at certain things, but I'm good at other things. This girl is like this, but you're like that. Self-control. Children are given everything right away. There's no waiting. There's instant gratification. Mommy, how many I remember when I was um, working with the, a child and a parent in Florida, and we were talking about how she has to have boundaries and um, what stop behaviors are, what start behaviors are. And she said, you know, she's really getting adjusted to that. She's understanding when I say that's one, that's two, she's getting it, but she keeps nagging me. You know, when, when, can, when are we going? When are we doing it? When can I get it? When can I get it? And I said to her, well, that's also something that you have to, you know, count for. That's not acceptable. She can't wait. It's a nagging behavior. Willingness to overcome difficulties rather than avoid problems. You know, this one is a real, real good point because that's one of the key things that we find with children today. They don't want to, it's not approaching the problem, it's avoiding the problem. 
They think that they're not going to talk about it. They're going to slide it under the rug. It's going to go away. And that's something that I start with from day one when I work with clients, when I work with parents, learning their emotions, being able to express them so that when there is a problem, knowing what they're feeling inside and how not to avoid it. And then, then we need some social skills, optimistic thinking patterns. So um, there is one thing that I want to touch on, and this is very brief, but there's the, one of the two things that will come up in camp is that some kids are going to be very dependent and homesick, and, and, and that's the cartoon. Hey, my mom is moving in with us for the semester of camp. And then there's the self-critical child. I can't do it. I'm not worthy. I must be perfect. I must make a mistake. And there is a little bit of a difference. And I think it just behooves us to mention it because you're going to have some kids like that. I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me because there's a difference in the camp. The self-critical is very preoccupied with achievement. Will I do good in the sports? Will I be able to be um, a great, like, will I be able to perform? They're going to be, their self-criticism of involves meeting perfectionist standards that they might have. And that helps if they feel perfectionist, they're protecting their own self-esteem. And what happens is it's an achievement related stress. They're more stressed about achieving as opposed to missing home or having a sense of belonging. So this is something that we need to make, need to know about our children and be aware of the difference because Self-critics may be especially vulnerable following failure in camp. There are going to be experiences that they're not that good at. And if they're going to take it too much to heart, it's going to make them turn into themselves, become very self-critical, not be able to look past it and not be able to look at the new experiences, appreciate the friends and the new friends and the new experiences. So that's why I, I just mention it because the dependent attachment style is different. You're involved with um, seeking, you're, you have a, you're preoccupied with seeking acceptance and love from others, self-esteem. So you could become vulnerable if a friend in camp rejects you, but you're still able, children, those children will still be able to cope with some distress of leaving home by let's say having more frequent contact with their family by phone or speaking to the camp mother. So they might cope by finding a new friend. So those kind of kids that are dependent are more apt to be a little more successful than kids that are just always self-critical about themselves. And that's why we see even dependent children, they're capable of leaving home if they've had a previous transition. They can use some coping um, strategies to overcome their separation anxiety. And then there's something that I did, which was a parent interview. And she said, there's no magic pill. People, a child, parents need to know it's okay if their child is homesick. There's no need to panic. Be aware of your own attitude in front of your child. And, and again, we discussed building resiliency in child. Even in the next six weeks, you notice some of the positive things about your children. Mention them. Don't always look for the negative. What do you see that your kid is doing right? And when you see them doing something right, don't just say, oh, you're so amazing. You're so good. It's so wonderful. What is good? What, you know, I remember writing an article about special ed kids and how they, some of them could get there by car, by train, by boat, by plane, but they all get there. That's special needs children. And I gave this article to two people in my family to read. And one of them said, oh, it was great. It was amazing. It was wonderful. And the other one said, I love that example about them getting there at different speeds, but that you encourage, you know, children can always get there. I knew which one read the article and which one didn't. So it's like very important to be specific about the positive traits that you see in your child. Wow, you baked this cake, that's amazing. You organized all the recipes, you knew the temperature. You could be a chef one day or someone that builds a great building. Okay, look at the openings you made here. You could be an architect, an engineer. So it's very important to do those things for your children and you could start today. If a parent doesn't have a good experience, they may unfortunately give over that vibe to the child. They may want the child to go to camp desperately or they're gonna be very over sympathetic and anxious if a child is ambivalent about going. That is what I see time and time again. I had a parent in my room and she was so anxious. She was fighting with her husband because she wanted to get 15 to 20 taps for her daughter 
She was worried about juicy and different designer outfits and that a child should have every right type of sneaker. She, and I asked her point blank, I looked at her and I said, what was your camp experience like? She said to me, it was horrible. My mother sent me with five tops, three from Rainbow, two that they were too low, and I had to have a drawstring pulled in there, like my three t-shirts had drawstring, I looked like a potato sack. She said, I didn't have enough underwear. I said, she said, we were going on a trip. I had to wash it by hand for the next day. And she said, it was like cold in the country. Nothing ever dries in the laundry in the country. I'm not gonna have my children go through that. And her anxiety was passing on to me and to her child in the room. So she didn't say this in front of her child, but I'm just saying your own experience just if it's not, if it wasn't a pleasant one, don't share it. Don't be over sympathetic and anxious about it. Be positive. Look at the positive things that can happen. Try to speak to somebody. See what another parent is doing and who had a positive experience. Then the parents spoke about camp and about missing camp. The idea that if the parents has a good experience, they will give over the vibe and enthusiasm. Some parents have told their kids that some of their best friends were from camp. And then there was a child interview. She knew she could be homesick. Her mom told her and jokingly said she would be a bit insulted if she wasn't missed. She made a joke of it. Are you, can you, what do you think? Of course you better miss home, but you know, that's normal. And this child said to her, she'll be okay. And she knew to speak to herself. And it was very nice, the example you gave with the pinky. You know, I ask, I tell some parents to, you know, give some transitional things to the child to take over. Like I asked her what a picture were. And she said, okay, that is so weird. I'm not gonna be nerdy. She said, but if I have it in my suitcase, it's good. I'm not leaving it out on the table. So she said, she took some fidget things from home. Reminders of home is helpful, but it would be weird. She said to put out a picture. Um, she said it was a good idea to have sleepovers with friends and cousins before camp to get the feeling. And that I encourage all of you to do. What was helpful was, she said, the overnight she had in the first half and also going and with somebody you were familiar with. And she was very cute. She said, I, grandparents and family sending emails. Packages are no longer allowed. I don't know which camps this is because kids get really jealous and upset. But I don't think there's any problem with letters. Sometimes I used to do this way back. I would put in a secret package in the suitcase just for when the child arrived with a letter and a little nosh. I know now people are sending suitcases of nosh. I never did that, but I stuck a few favorites in their suitcase. Um, and she said something else that was very helpful for her was her mom packed her up very organized and she started me off very organized and closing in boxes and I was able to continue it. So that was also very nice. I'm going to touch briefly on the difference between separation anxiety disorder and homesickness. Homesickness is, like we said, leaving home a familiar environment. Um, but a homesick child could be open to and distracted by new experiences and friendships, someone comes over to them, a counselor, a uh, camp, but it's really more about a relational attachment to the physical home and things around it. Their bed, their privacy, they get a little homesick for that. And child could be homesick the first year when it's new, but then they don't. A homesick child, you know, for the next year they won't. A homesick child might need some additional attention. Symptoms of extreme homesickness can mimic social anxiety disorder, where the children are struggling with a lot more than interpersonal interactions. is refusing to eat, crying inconsolably, begging persistently to call home or return home, and persistent preoccupation. So that's kind of where there's anxiety from the separation from the person that they're attached to. And it doesn't desist, it keeps growing. And nothing, new experiences, distracting, new friendships can't overcome the feelings of depression and loneliness. And I think that's also very important to make a distinction of because we end up panicking right away and we don't even get the child to adjust. It needs a couple of days and, you know, and, and the risk factors for homesickness is a disorganized camp, an untrained staff, a child never sleeping away from home to camp, a parents inappropriate responses. Now, building resiliency, the coping strategies, I mean, a lot of us know this, but it's checking in with feelings, reading to the kid, maybe getting a book and reading the child, you know, what, 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 what books are 
about new camp experiences. So the child sees, oh, there's actually a book about this. Someone else felt this way. And then she holds that when she goes, practicing deep breathing, talking with someone, just you know, taking a note of this, you know, using positive self-talk, like this little girl said, it's gonna pass, it's gonna pass. I'm gonna feel better tomorrow, I'll feel better tomorrow. Writing in a journal, calling and drawing, making a plan. Today, I'm gonna to call my mother three times, tomorrow, two times, you know. Giving these ideas to the kids beforehand will help your child or your teen. So for preparing for a camp experience, which does build resiliency, is I suggest that you let your child plan their summer experience, help you with the packing and the choosing of clothes, organizing some practice times away like sleepovers, um, getting pamphlets, going to pictures about camp, what the child should expect, expect write a, a work on letter writing and make it easy for kids to stay in touch. You know, a lot of kids don't know how to write a letter. Teaching them, I, I mean, I, my son sent me home I don't even know how that letter got to me. He was, he was initially sending me an envelope that I had already pre-put a stamp, but I didn't put my address. And I wasn't getting mail for the first week or two. He just gave it and he, you know, the counselor had so much mail, she didn't realize, he didn't realize that it wasn't, you know, and then I learned. I got an envelope, put my address on it, put the return address on it, put a stamp on it, going through that with the child. Um, you can even mail a letter to your child before they leave for camp or hide one in the suitcase, as I mentioned. Personalize their camp living um, space with familiar bed linens and other comforts at home. I always tell parents to try to get the same bed linen that they have at home, a favorite pillow, a stuffed animal, and then encouraging your child to stay active, make new friends. Never make the pickup deal. Don't offer your children, I'm going to pick you up from camp if things don't go well. Making this deal will significantly reduce the chances of your child's success at summer camp. The deal also plants the seeds. If you tell them, I'll pick you up any time, that means, oh, it might go bad. It might not be good. And you don't want that. You are suggesting already that camp won't, you won't like camp. You're never going to say to a child, okay, if you don't want that ice cream, don't you worry, honey. I'll, I'll take it away from you. Just take one taste and you'll see, you'll love it. You're not even expecting them not to love ice cream. But when you start making deals with them, it undermines the idea of camp being an amazing thing. You're just suggesting that their solution is to escape. So it also undermines the surrogate caregivers, camp staff who are trying to help your children cope with homesickness. So here's something that I hope works, hold on. As a parent, you may wonder what you can do to help your son get past feeling homesick. It starts even before you get to camp. Here's what not to do. I know you're worried about going to sleep away camp, but don't worry. If you get homesick or don't like it, you can call me. If you don't like it, Yates will drive you home. If you don't like it, I will come pick you up whenever you would like. Bargaining with your son rarely works. Because if he thinks you'll come and get him, that's all he's going to focus on while he's here. How will he know if he can succeed if he never even gives it a chance? Instead, try this. You're going to make so many friends and go on so many adventures. I bet when I come to get you, you won't even want to come home. Another great idea is reading books about summer camp, like The Secret Ingredients of Summer Camp Success by Dr. Christopher Thurber or The Summer Camp Handbook. We encourage you to write letters to your son, but try not to overdo it. <laughs> Writing too many letters can create homesickness. We suggest a few letters a week. And again, when writing letters, here's a list of things not to say. We miss you so much. Went to the beach this weekend. Boy, did you miss out on a good time. When writing letters, ask a lot of questions. Make it about him and the things that are going on here at camp, not about home. the first few days the letters home will start to get better i got your letter today oh it sounds like you're having a fantastic time what other activities are you doing 
Have you made any best friends yet? So, um, yeah, never, never tell your children where you went on a trip without them or what's happening or this one got engaged or they feel like they're missing out. So you want to be careful. Now, if your child is showing indicators of homesickness, um, alert the camp, talk with the kids at advance to know how the camp will likely prepare for the separation. Parents, again, should convey confidence, enthusiasm, and other positive feelings and statements whenever they're dropping the child off at home. Know that homesick is them, and it's comforting for the kids to learn how to deal with it in advance. And then, you know, it's, it's nice for the kids to know, and that's why I like to read books to them, that that is a possibility, and it's okay. And actually to even describe what the sensation would be like, you know, it's scary, it, 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 you know, you might be worried about being away from home, you might have butterflies in your stomach. But children who've already left home and are struggling, you know, just reach out to the camp. And that really, that's really the main thing. Like everybody, even Camp 101 will know about homesickness. And just setting up a conversation and recognizing uh, who can help your child and Telling the child that there's people that can help him if something goes wrong is also a good preparation. What can help kids cope? Four things that can help kids have a good time in camp is having a good relationship with a counselor. Having a, not even a best friend, because you know my granddaughter went and she said that she, she was very brave. She went herself. She said she knew two people, like they were, she was cute. She says to me, Matt Bobby, they were only acquaintances. Like they weren't my best friends, but when they saw that I was down, they were really nice and they came over to me, feeling liked and respected by other campers and staying in close contact with families back home. So across all campers, being liked and respected was less important actually than adapting to camp, than maintaining with contact with home, having a good friend and a good relationship. That's what it helped pull them through. Do's and don'ts for summer camps. Do focus on how much camp, I can't say this enough, do focus on how much fun camp will be. Tell them it's natural to miss their parents and home with their way and that it's normal, normalize it. Write encouraging, cheerful letters to your child. Um, there's not an option to call you or come home early for that. And remind yourself that there are more tears at the end of the camp when they're all saying goodbye at the buses. Hey, all the girls are sobbing and we're gonna miss you and so amazing. So it's very important to keep in mind and keep thinking. And I know I loved how you said it, Goldie, that the rabbit said that like you're away, you're secluded. These are some of the, there's just no, even parents are preoccupied even when they're giving kids a good, you know, a good time. And one of the things that, you know, um, Rabbi Wallerstein, I was, you know, watching one of his tapes and he said it so beautifully, Rabbi Wallerstein, he said that like, you know, when you go out to a family dinner with all the kids and you're on your phones, you think you're taking them out to dinner and you're giving them a treat, but you're really not on and you're, you're, you're disconnected. So that's what the beauty of camp is. Now, um, the benefits of teaching coping strategies, it'll help them manage stress, help them manage their emotions. It improves their self-regulation and it builds confidence. And the good camp experiences, again, will give you supportive relationships, new opportunities, um, just a really nice thing. I, I, personally, I didn't love camp, but I had a similar experience in the bungalow counties, growing up with friends and having counselors there. And um, sometimes I liked my camp experiences, sometimes not, but I, I definitely, gained from both. And I wouldn't have imagined not having either of them. It really, I have some friends from their life and it was just nice to, to see new and different things and just seeing how different people lived. You know, you have a friend from LA, you have a friend, I mean, I know in Chabad that's very not common, but in our community, <laughs> we really know the people that we know. So camp was like, oh my gosh, someone was from Israel, someone was from 
LA, it was just a wonderful experience seeing, seeing different people's experiences. And lastly, um, the reasons that great parents choose summer camps for their cat, kids is not just to ship them off and have a break. I need a break, is what parents keep saying. And hopefully you will get your break, but really knowing that the kids get unplugged, unplugged they'll meet positive role models, they'll develop better communication skills, they're gonna to learn to make and keep friends, they'll be happier, they'll discover their best self and they'll develop independence and hopefully experience some outdoor fun and adventure. Thank you all for listening. And I hope I got enough of, um, in, in my rushed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christy. That was like unbelievable. And as a camp director, there were so many parts that really, I could relate to. Um, I just have a few questions that people messaged me <clears throat> that I wanted to ask or, or just even stress. Um, so the first thing, um, in one of your slides, you mentioned sending emails and um, not writing so much about what's going on at home, but asking questions. And whenever parents are telling me like, no, my child's so homesick, I always suggest that when they're emailing them, they should ask questions and tell their child, like keep all the emails. So when I get that first phone call with you, like I want, I want to hear those answers. So when they come with that first phone call, that first phone call is always so rushed. Like, how are you? And then I, I get a, I get a message from like a parent, like, I didn't even speak to my child or were like, they were so flustered. They just started crying because they heard my voice. So when the child feels like empowered, like I have my emails, I know what my mother wants to know. And now I'm going to answer them. Um, that's just super helpful. So like, I just best for peers, kids that they know that they're going to spend that five minutes. They're talking to their mom and not delve on the fact that they're like really nervous and, and missing their family. So, but one of the questions that came in is if your child is really homesick and calls you like say four days in or even a camp director like I know for me if like by day three there's still a camper that's struggling I let the parents know that the child is having a hard time hasn't happened before if the parent hasn't let me know so um is there ever a time that you think that a child should come home um I know for me in our 10 years of overnight camp there have been many not many there have been kids that left because the parents felt that that was the most important thing um there was one time that a child wasn't eating and this was her protest. Like well, that's she was what, saying, I'm not eating. I, yeah, well, that's what I kind of like tried to put up that slide and right. it wasn't too rushed about the difference between homesickness and separation anxiety. Because when it turns into not being able to eat, not being able to be distracted from any good times, you know, if a child is homesick, but then be distracted with good experiences or, you know, if part of the day was good, but they're still crying. And it depends how long it takes. It, you should right. see it tapering off. But what usually happens, I find, is that the parents don't have the staying power. They get too nervous. That the kids right, that, that's what I'm saying. So um, so this parent saying, like, but, but I really felt it was the right thing to bring the child home. Now, at the end, she followed my advice and her child stayed and had a wonderful summer and is coming back this summer. But I'm wondering, like, I, I mean, I guess here we have a platform that I feel like we should stress the parents that homesickness is normal. Like, I mean, you stress this, but well, that's, even that's, if your child is begging you, right? let, let them experience that's, this immediately. And again, I can't say this enough. It's the parents being able to tolerate the children's dysregulation. When their child is dysregulated, many parents become very triggered and anxious and worried. And they just want to get them out of that stress. And that's part of the problem that I see in my office time and time again, that children are not allowed to feel the stress because it's the worst feeling. And the problem with that is when you do everything for the child and you take care of it right away, they can't experience discomfort. And you know what? In life, you're going to have this comfort and uncomfortable situations. You'll have a mean Rebbe, you'll have a bad boss, you'll have a friend who lets you down, you'll have a bad camp experience, maybe the next one will be better. But if you're used to that uncomfortable feeling because somebody didn't swoop you away, then you're able to tolerate it. I mean, it's like it brings to mind, you know, a Malik, you know, when he put the first foot into the hot water, 
he cooled it off to everybody else. And that's what we want to do. We want you to experience it so that it's not as hot, that uncomfortable feeling. You know, the last thing that I forgot to mention is tefillah. I mean, that is tefillah, tefillah, and more tefillah. If you, you know, you keep davening. Before I got onto this, I asked the Yulu Ratzon, Hashem should put the right words in my mouth. And again, parents, you send the kids off, say some tehillim. The phone call is going to come in, say some tehillim. It just, you know, it, it just helps. So, and we know yeah. that, you know, it's, it's really, you know, we do the Arishtablis, we do the best we can, but if it's meant to be, or if it's not the right year, you can't really beat yourself up. I also wanted to mention that hanging pictures now is very common and very cool. When you walk into the bunkhouses, very often by the girls' beds, they have their pictures and it does make the girls, no, the boys, the boys don't hang up pictures, but our girls definitely hang up pictures and it makes them feel like there's a piece of home inside, you know, right next to them if they need to see them and speak to them. Well, Goldie, I'm um, so, so glad you're telling me that because I, you know, when my, my, my little granddaughter tell me that I was a little bit disappointed because I know any family member of mine that's ever been in the hospital, you know, I immediately, one of the things I do if they're there for longer than a few days, or I will make a huge collage of their children and their grandchildren and relatives. And it's just so comforting for the patient then the nurses come in and say, oh, what is this? It's just such a wonderful connecting thing. And if a child could bring that picture without being embarrassed or made fun of, that's amazing. It's, it's, yeah, and it's, it's, and it's really I, I if there's any camp directors on here, I would suggest that that should be one of the requests that everybody should show mm -hmm. a picture with their family. And we're going to hang up a huge collage in the bunkhouse. It's and a great conversation starter too, because Right. I mean, when girls are getting to know each other, they're talking about their family and their little baby sister and their sibling and their brother that annoys them. You know and here I'm, it's like I'm, I'm loving that idea. I think that's what we need to do. We need to alert all camp directors to request <laughs> family. I'll pass on the message. Send out the announcement. This way they um, can sit there and it's there. There's definitely one more thing that I feel like I should just reiterate, and it was reiterated many times, but it is so important as parents to hold back from saying anything of the sort that I'm going to pick you up. I can't even tell you how often we deal with a child who walks in, doesn't even, is not even off the bus and is already saying, my mother promised me she'll pick me up if I don't like it. But she didn't even give her, like she didn't even eat supper the first night. She didn't even get to that point because she knows that her parent is picking her up. So I know parents, we love to problem solve and our child is getting on the bus and she's crying and we're just ready to promise her the world. But please refrain because it really it, yeah, that's, that is the number one no, because yeah. there is a getaway exit and children will experience one frisson of discomfort and they want the getaway exit. Because remember, our children are not used to experiencing discomfort. So, They're not used to problem solving. Yeah, and that's why, you know, if you give them that exit right away and we think the child will be open, like if they know they could escape and I'll pick you up, but it's not a good thing to start with. Yeah. Well, Risky, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful and so enlightening, and I'm sure many parents now feel like empowered to speak to their children and best prepare their children to have a unbelievable summer filled with growth and fun experiences. Thank you. Goldie, do you run a camp? Yes, oh. I'm a camp director. Love to send my children there, all my grandchildren. <laughs> okay. Well, feel anyway, free. So, thank you so much for your input, and thank you again to this wonderful. Yes, thank um, you, NCFC. And thank you for having me. Have a wonderful night and Hatzlacha with all your camp, uh, your camp experiences, and you should all have a successful summer, and your children should have one too. Okay, thank you all so much. Have a good night. Good night.